Sean Robinson, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? Hi, Melissa. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Sean, where are you joining us from today? I am from uh, Ontario, Canada, uh, about two hours west of Toronto, sorry, east of Toronto. Excellent. You know, it's oddly uh, a pattern that whenever I get guests from Canada, it reminds me, why didn't I learn anything about Canada when I was growing <laughs> up? I know a lot about different parts of the world, but there seems to be a huge gaping hole about Canadian geography in general. So I'm going to learn more about that. I think we, we hide in plain sight. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll look into that a, another day, but <laughs> I invited you here to not only talk about Canadian geography, but to talk about a, what you do for a living. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so right now I'm a electrical project manager. Um, I've spent 20 years nearly working as a electrician, kind of working my way through uh, apprenticeship to kind of more of a, a management position. Um, I'm also a volunteer firefighter. I've done that for since actually August 1st will be 20 years. Mm. So I've spent a lot of time doing that on the side, um, responding to anything you know, through the day, at night, uh, before work, during work, uh, you know, mm -hmm. as, as things arise. So uh, kind of a an extensive background in, in the construction and very um, tough masculine environments. So it's kind of uh, built me for who I am and, and what experience I've, uh, I've come here to talk about. I live in a small community and we rely on the volunteer EMS, fire, paramedics, so thank you for doing what you do. Even though it's not my community, we would be lost without volunteers throughout the world. So I really appreciate that you do that. Well, thank you. It's uh, it's definitely not for everyone, but uh, those that of us that do it uh, have a lot of pride in it. So, now Sean, um, you mentioned a lot of um, machismo. You didn't use that word. I'm putting words in your mouth, but a lot of macho stuff. Is that a little bit about what you're going to talk to us about today? What's behind all of that? Uh, it is. Uh, so working construction and, and coming from the background, my dad's a mechanic and I grew up with a, a lot of time spent outside in the garage helping fix cars. I fixed my own, um, decided I didn't want to be a mechanic, but very tough masculine environment. Um, the fire department uh, is a very tough masculine environment, the same, and there's a lot of expectations around those environments and, and it speaks more in general and not, um, you know, however we identify, but, you know, speaking from my background, very, very, um, tough masculine environment expected to live a certain lifestyle, maintain a certain, um, identity and, and basically carry a certain way about everything we do and for for my story it it kind of it, it, i noticed a pattern in my drinking that that spoke to you know how people around me were were drinking alcohol and i made a decision and i could get more to that but i made a decision to stop drinking or to at that time take a break and it was unbelievable to me how much extra pressure and expectation there was with the circles that I was in and still am in to maintain that lifestyle. And the choice you made, it wasn't about being an alcoholic necessarily, but it was about a whole group of behaviors that alcohol was a part of that brought about this change for you. Absolutely. There was, um, and speaking from my, my childhood, I guess, uh, to, to bring, to bring that my, my parents were together. They were married quite young. I was born when they were in their 20, early 20s. So there was a social lifestyle that they had had. And there was a lot of friends and, you know, parties and functions. And it seemed from an early age, alcohol was, was an acceptable part of all of it. 
um, to a point where I knew how to mix a, a proper rye and ginger ale when I was, you know, very young, but eight, nine years old. Now I was never consuming it at that point, but it was just there and it was acceptable. So from that environment, getting drinks from the fridge or the cooler to counting the, the beer cans to return for the deposits or whatever, it was just everywhere. And I, I thought I had a good teaching and a good handle of how I was supposed to be when I was holding my own functions or when I was drinking, because I had to maintain a certain stock, know how to serve and host and all these things. And then, you know, fast forward to a bit of my own adulthood, I created my own habits and routines around that and, um, developed into what I thought was the social acceptable, um, uh, identity, you know, towards drinking. And it, it was, um, taking all of that and then uh, the, the whole time developing into this, this person that never even thought about not having it in my life. And to, 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 to speak about the uh, non-addictive part of it, uh, I didn't feel like I was, uh, addicted, but looking back, there was definitely some moments and I just felt like it had to be there everything I was doing. If I was barbecuing, if I was going to a function and it was there, I had to participate. If it was, there was someone was coming over, we had to have a drink because that's what you do when you socialize, you do so around having this, this alcoholic beverage. And all of these things were, were habits and routines that I, that I know it's not just common to me, but that's, we, we have this ingrained in us that we have to have this while we're doing certain things. And it was, it was just wanting to be healthier. I was upwards of 320 pounds, feeling pretty miserable mentally, physically, and I needed to make some healthier lifestyle choices and removing alcohol for at least a little while, um, was something that kind of became much more, but in the moment it was something I could remove that would help me start to think about losing weight or not eating uh, unhealthy or whatever. So it didn't start as coming from the, uh, the addiction or, or the, um, you know, what it was doing other than, you know, the healthy lifestyle. So what started happening in your social circles when you said, no, thank you when alcohol was being served? So when, when I decided to, to make a change, it was at the end of 2020. So it was the first year of COVID and, and, and much, I think the same everywhere whatever limitations and shutdowns were in place, alcohol was never not available. Um, not to speak for some, some different dry communities, but it was easily accessible. And I found myself cause we weren't in Ontario, that was a lot more stringent than I think other locations, but we weren't allowed to do much, but I could always stop on my way from my, uh, um, place of employment, which was considered essential. Um, I could stop and grab stuff I could, and we weren't going out in the evening. So it was, um, easily for me to just have a few drinks in the evening or whatever. So to, uh, to have it became so like I was drinking a lot more and to, to end 2020, making the decision to do dry January, it was, it was okay. And it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of pressure because there was a lot of people doing dry January. You get through Christmas and, and the, the, the festivities and functions that Christmas season and holiday season would include. And, you know, it, it was okay for, for someone to, to not drink. So January became quite easy. Although about two weeks in, there was a lot of people that had committed to whatever version of the resolutions, New Year's resolutions they had, they would drop off. They would say, oh, I've made it two weeks or, you know, uh, the first function after new year's comes up and someone goes right back to old habits. I wasn't doing that. So people around me that would fall off, they were surprised I was continuing to go getting through January and into February. I didn't feel like I'd been away enough to do what I wanted to do. So dry February, um, is something I committed to right away. And I started to feel more and more pressure as I got through February into March and, and establishing new goals for how long I thought I wanted to do this for, because people couldn't believe that I just wasn't that person anymore. They couldn't believe that I could go to a function and not drink, or they, they didn't believe that, that I wasn't going to, you know, 
celebrate that I'd made it that far and just continue where I was. And, and it, it was almost more of a drive for me to prove everybody wrong. Um, as much as it was important for me to, to continue because the, just, you know, the circles I was in, it just wasn't normal for someone that was such a big participant in, in drinking and, and whatever to just not do it anymore. So internally, it must have felt good or you wouldn't have continued. Can you tell us what was happening internally that propelled you to keep going with February and March and on down the road? I think in the beginning, I didn't know exactly what I was like, how long I was doing this for and even committing to the different months. It was you know, you, 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 you picture the big picture and a lot of the big picture is what makes us not be successful in our goals. So by breaking it down smaller, it definitely helped me without knowing it, but looking back and, and, and feeling different after the first month and second month, maybe I didn't feel as good, but getting through, you know, the, the hundred days became the next goal from the to dry February and then committing to what was all of 2021 it setting those goals I could I felt so much better as time went on and listening to different podcasts and reading uh, and listening to audio books and regular books and learning a lot more about the different habits and ways to control habits and different uh, tools for getting through goal setting and and habit tracking and all that it, it definitely helped keep me in line and, and I was feeling so much better. My, I've got three young kids under 10 years old and, and I was waking up not like I was feeling miserable. My, my attitude had, had changed substantially. So I had a lot more patience for what small children will, what, what they bring and, and all of these things translated to the relationships that I have with you know, coworkers and family and friends. And, and, and so my, my mental relationships and, and with that, but just physically a lot more energy I've since lost, uh, about a hundred pounds, um, with, you know, not having this and not snacking, but also paying more attention to the other things that I can do that, that come second to what I had set forth for myself. And, and it is such a substantial difference that I haven't gone back. I still remain um, sober, not drinking. And and I, I needed to create the tools that I could use in, in environments where alcohol is around that I didn't have before to not drink. So by drinking something different or pouring it into a coffee mug or some sort of special different, even if it's a red solo cup, at least pouring something else in there gives me the mechanism to still play the game without playing the game. Yeah. And sometimes it's just about what gets you through the moment. Definitely. It, it's, it's having that, like I said, mechanism, like holding that cup and simulating that, like that, that, um, common, um, mechan like movement that that everyone else is doing and even if it's just holding that in your hand while other like you're you're mingling and talking it, it it takes the pressure away from everyone around you because when i was going through that it was awkward for people around me to then not have me doing that and and while i was trying to figure it out and and what i needed to do to be successful it was it was like People didn't know how to handle me, so they made it more awkward. If I was ordering something not alcoholic at a at a restaurant, because I still tried to go out, like I still tried to to you know live my life without this in it, and it was like I'd order, and even in the beginning, I didn't drink the non alcoholic or mocktail options, but nine ten months through through twenty twenty one, I started to have a couple of these, um, and and just to try them out. I'd order one and people, oh, he's not, he's not an alcoholic. He's just, he's just not drinking. And I found people were defending it for me, even though I didn't need them to do that. And it was like, they needed to justify it. Like, like it needed something and, and the awkwardness around it, it took some, some learning for, for everyone around me to figure out how to deal with that. Have they navigated the space too? Are they more comfortable now with who you are? 
Uh, absolutely. I think in any lifestyle change, like you're going to lose some people along the way and, and it, it is a difficult thing to consider, but we have to be prepared for that. And you don't really know who and when it's just, you start to change. And if those people don't accept who you are and who you're becoming, like you have to be prepared to move on and not go back. So while most of my circles have stayed intact, there, there's definitely some relationships that have changed and, and some for the better, like my, uh, I wrote a book, um, it's called going dry, my path to overcoming habitual drinking. And in this book, I talk about, uh, being in a wedding during this year of, of change for me and this wedding, my friend, um, was in my wedding and it was a point when I was drinking and we had a, you know, a lot of drinks and a good time and now it's his wedding and I'm not that person anymore. So while I wanted to be there for him and I was there for him, there was a lot of pressure from him that held over me that year of change because he kept telling me, you'd better drink at my wedding. You'd better drink at my wedding. And while I wasn't going to, I didn't know uh, during a lot of this, how long I was doing this for, but I was pretty sure his September wedding wasn't going to have me drinking at it. And when we got fitted for the suits and where we did the bachelor parties and the, the showers and all these things, every time I kept hearing, you better drink at my wedding. And, and all of those pressures over me that entire year, by the end of, of the year, he, he above everybody else started to come around. So we were at one of these functions and, and he had said, or we, everybody around me was ordering these shots and, and drinks and double, um, whatever's. And I ordered a diet Pepsi and he, everybody else was served. And then again, and I, I was just sitting there trying not to not have a good time, try not to bring the environment down. And eventually he spoke up to the server and say, listen, can you, can we please say like, he hasn't had his drink yet. And it was small moments through the year. That being one of the big examples where the people around me started to, to realize how to deal with with me. And, and I say that it sounds bad, but there was never really non-alcoholic options available at, at, uh, my friend's places, right? Everybody stocks the latest, you know, uh, what they're drinking and what their friends might have, but we're not facilitating it otherwise. And, and I don't ask anybody to do that, but it was kind of neat to see people starting to have some of these 0% to send some, some different, you know, soda waters or whatever, just in case me or other people, because because I found a lot more people, especially from 2020, 2021, when I started, there's a lot more people deciding to do this and not drink alcohol. And, and, and it was, it's been really cool to see the support. Do you think your choices gave them permission to make choices that would benefit them as well? Uh, I think some of that is, uh, yeah, I, I think for sure. Um, back to my construction and, and that masculine and even toxic masculine environment, you know, we're not talking about self help and, and betterment and development and all these things We're we're maintaining, staying in our lane, living the same lifestyle. And, and I think having someone that's not doing it anymore. And, and I was still going out after work, to, um, you know, with these people and still friends with these people and to just not do it anymore. I, I have found others around me just not doing it as well. And whether I'm the one where they see, oh, he's not going to do it. So am I, I think in any group, if, if you're going to stand out for whatever it is you believe in, you will find support. And I, I have seen that. I have seen people come out, um, where they, they'll order the, the 0% or they'll not drink, um, for either their own or the same reasons. What advice would you give to someone who's having that moment? And well, before we get to that, did you have a moment uh, maybe in that December before dry January, or was it just a culmination of feelings? But did you have a moment when you said, this is it, this has got to change? Yeah, there was, it was a, um, quite an accumulation of, of moments, uh, to that point at the end of the 2020. I'd always had an issue with weight and it was, it's for any number of typical normal reasons, but, um, there was a lot of, of moments where my drinking was not, it didn't, it, it wasn't good. Like I noticed some, and I don't want to say generational trauma, but you know, there was, my dad drank and 
there was some moments where I think he would have wished he could have been different. And I started to notice a pattern from what, what I grew up with. And I, I had, I was irritable and I would yell and I would do these things and, and then feel bad about it later. I would wake up the next day and, and not be happy for how the night before went and, and being overweight and feeling terrible and in this headspace where I had to fix it myself and where I had to not ask for help and not reach out and remain tough. And like, there was a lot of moments where I was confused and I was unsure and I never thought about not being here, but you know, when you feel like you have to fix it yourself and you can't reach out and you, you have to just know how to do it automatically, you know, I was, I was in a pretty dark place and, and it wasn't until I started to give myself permission by not drinking as simple as one small thing can be. It was like, I could look into these other things that were going to help me. I could ask for some help or I could listen to the books or I could listen to the podcast and, and, and pursue uncomfortable because I could already be this person. Why can't I be that person too? And, and it, it was, it was such a transition that, that, um, I was able to find that it wasn't any more that anybody else can do too. You know, we all have this capability. It's just finding that, that thing that, that you say, you know what, I can be that person. I can read the books or I can go for a walk or I can start to exercise. It's, it's all just how we feel about it. Well, in your life is such a great example of you don't have to do all the things all at once. You found one thing that would make a big difference in your life and you worked on that and then it led to other opportunities. Definitely. It, it was, it was easy to compound one thing into the next. And when I started to learn about habits and, and routines and how to change habits, um, and, and that was where the kind of the hundred day mark came out, but it was, you know, 21 days or, or 60 days and, and the, the different, um, versions of that, that say what it takes to break a habit. I found by writing down on the calendar and, and I had circles and checks and boxes and marks and all these things on my calendar that nobody would know except me for all the things I was trying to work on. And when I started to do it, I started with just brushing my teeth. It was, I wasn't happy. I wasn't doing it twice a day. You know, I have a few dentist appointments with cavities, but I, I, I started by doing it every morning, every night. So I'd have a check in the morning, check at night. And I did that. It was 30 days, a hundred days. And then after a hundred days, I stopped keeping track of it to make sure that it was something I could just continue to do without documenting it. And some things were easier than others, but I, I was working on drinking, you know, as many glasses of water a day, brushing my teeth twice a day, not drinking alcohol, um, you know, doing some form of exercise, even if it's, you know, three sit-ups, just something. And, and then seeing that over the hundred days and beyond, and then building from it. You know, once I stopped keeping track of brushing my teeth or working on three things at a time, you take doing five sit-ups a day for a hundred days and you start to do 10 or you start to, you know, if I can do 50 today, but I can only do two or 10 tomorrow, it's just something every day to keep going. And, and I, I found it was amazing to just compound on that and keep going. Yeah. And obviously you've, you've experienced some tremendous results. What advice would you give to someone who's in that dark place right now that's wondering how to make a change? I think the, the biggest thing is that we don't know everything. Um, I, I'm as stubborn as the next person and it held me down for a long time. And, and once I realized that I wasn't expected to fix it myself and I could ask for help and I could learn about these things. It's the only way we're going to get the right information. We're not going to find it, you know, f following certain things that are toxic, right? Follow uh, some of these like lifestyle accounts on Instagram or, you know, any of the socials and you'll get that tidbit every day rather than something that, you know, isn't going to be productive. So the biggest thing is just be open to learning about the kinds of things that will help fix it because we, we don't know, we're not expected to know, but we like to tell ourselves we're, we're experts. And tell us the name of your book again. 
Uh, my book is called Going Dry, My Path to Overcoming Habitual Drinking. Uh, it's available on Amazon and most bookstores online. That link is in the show notes. So folks, make sure you click on that link and check out the book. Uh, is there anywhere else we can connect with you, Sean? Um, I am on Facebook. Uh, Facebook account is Going Dry. Uh, my Instagram account is going.dry. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's, uh, it's linked on my website, which is uh, seanrobinson.ca. Um, I've got some updating to do there, but all my, my stuff's going to be, going to be there. And, and I guess one important note on my book is very much against, uh, masculine and, and the trades and background I come from was, was the concept of journaling. Um, when I started this thing ending 2020, I started this journal and it was kind of a place for me to just beat myself up and, and just question without having to listen or, or have anybody give me advice I wasn't ready for. And I maintained this journal through the decision to change and through this year that was me documenting the, the not drinking part. And, and when I got through about nine, 10 months, just after the wedding into another social function, a buddy had asked, you know, how is everything going? And, and it was a genuine question, even though he was ordering and drinking his double tequila, something or other. Um, I said, oh, I could write a book. And I'd said it in, in a, in a, in a general statement that there'd been so much that had happened that, that year that, that I really could have. And it kind of dawned on me in that moment that I, I had, mm -hmm. I'd maintained this journal. I had written this, this down. And while it was a place for me to document and beat myself up, it became interesting to me to be able to give that back in some form to where I was at when I was getting started, where I didn't know how to get started or how to reach out or who to talk to or what to even do to come from the, the place where I thought I knew everything and where I was, this is just who I am mentality and, and in a place where I just had to stay in my lane and maintain a lifestyle. It was, it was the decision to change that I could have used that resource. So at that, that mark and through the remainder of that year, it was, it was from less to a place of. I need to just maintain this for my own to how can I make it that a reader will understand and can, and will see. And, and it, it was, it was kind of a project for me to work on, to see if, if it was something that would, would be worth it. And, and I just, we're not vulnerable. We feel like we have to hide these things and we can't show weakness, but it's through, you know, that as my own form of therapy, by putting that out there for my old self that could have used it, that, that I, I really feel the benefit. Well, how has your definition of manhood changed in this journey? I think my definition is, is less tough and granular as it was maintaining that lifestyle of being tough and, and not showing weakness. And, and I think, I think we're a lot stronger when we let people in. And when we show to our children and to our friends that we're human and we're, you know, we have moments, we're not always going to be a hundred percent. We're going to, you know, be upset. We're going to be happy. We're going to have all of these range of emotion. And I think manhood and, and manliness and all those things need that range of motion of emotion and need weakness when we need to be weak and strength when we need to be strong. And, and the only way for us to, to be healthy mentally and physically is to allow that. Sounds like authenticity is a big <laughs> part of your definition. Yes, for sure. Sean, this is so much to digest and I just applaud you on all the work that you've done. It's difficult work. It's very difficult work and you've done it. You've taken small steps that have yielded huge results and I think that's amazing to see. So thank you for sharing that journey with us. Yes. Thank you for, uh, for having me here. I, uh, uh I'm, I'm happy to, to share this to, to anybody that, that needs to hear it. I think, I don't think there's enough people in general, but especially not enough men talking about vulnerability and, you know, what might be considered weakness and, and we need to just have more conversations about it. All right, friends, you've heard it here first. Make a bold move. Click the links below, connect with Sean, and start doing the work, and you'll see amazing change. Thanks, Sean. Thank you very much.